definitive restorations. So some of you may say, well, you know what? That sounds great, but I have a PPO practice and I accept all this insurance and I don't have time to do this. I have to see patients because I'm not really getting paid well from the insurance companies. So when you learn these protocols, you basically stand, standardize your treatment. You work more predictably, you work more efficiently. You do the work correctly so there's no do-overs, there's no broken provisionals, there's no emergencies between visits. You can actually maximize your per hour production. You can combine visits and you can do more dentistry per visit and that's how you increase your profits. Eventually you gain confidence and you can actually limit PPO participation. But you need to be able to do this and you need to be able to deliver and you need to be able to do something that everybody else who accepts PPO cannot do in order for you to be able to deliver this type of dentistry in a fee-for-service setting. So if you're participating with any insurances, I think this is a must. I think I would recommend that you look into this and you do this so that you can do less dentistry and be more profitable. So when we replace a central incisor, I came up with a few things that we change just by one tooth. We change the aesthetics, the phonetics. We change the anterior guidance. We change the, the anterior context. We change the envelope of function. We could impinge on the neutral zone. We could change the gingival architecture or the papillae, the embrasures, the midline, and then of course, the golden proportion that drives all of our anterior aesthetics. So when you look at these patients and they come in like these with all of their teeth worn, what are we going to do differently for these patients so that our porcelain restorations doesn't have the same fate as they are now? Let's sit here. So we're actually going to start our occlusion from the temporal mandibular joint. So when we look at the joint, we look at a biconcave articular disc fully seating in between a convex condyle and a convex articular eminence. And that is important because where the jaw sits here, really matters here. It really matters on the, on the teeth. We cannot, it's not about taking stone models on a bench top and figuring out which way they fit well, which way they fit against each other in the best MI occlusion. We have to take into consideration how the joy is seating before we can do anything with the teeth. So, we call this fully seated joint position centric relation, and it all starts from here. Every occlusal scheme should start with a fully seated joint. So it is the uppermost, most anterior, most comfortable bone brace position of the condyle in the glenoid fossa, and we call this home plate. This is where it all starts. There's nothing mystical about it. We need to have a fully joint, uh, a fully seated joint before we start doing our treatment. So then what we look for is once the joint is seated, then we want all the teeth to touch at the same time with the same force when we bite together. Something has to keep the teeth from super erupting, the ones that are not hitting, and most likely some sort of a substitute, and, and in most cases, that would be the tongue. 
So we want to make sure that the joint is seated fully, and we want to make sure that when we close, all the teeth are hitting at the same time, and nothing and nothing is in the way of that jaw seating at the condyle correctly. So what we don't want, we don't want this. This is an animation by Bite Effects that I use a few times a day. So we don't want the jaw to close together. We don't want the teeth to hit where we get a premature contact and then the jaw has to slide for the teeth to close together. So we're actually looking at the teeth biting all together at the same time. And what we want to do is we want to create non-interfering posterior teeth. So all the joints in our body are made to work properly from a fully seated position. So when the movement starts, it has to start from a fully seated position. The same thing applies to the temporal mandibular joint. It must be fully seated when it starts working to allow proper movement. So the desired occlusal scheme that we're looking for where back teeth don't rub only happens from a fully seated uh, joint position. So we're looking for dots in the back and we're looking for lights in the front. And that happens only when the joint is seated and the teeth and the jaw starts to move from a fully seated joint position. So a key point here is that the biggest enemy of a stable occlusion, comfort, and maintainable oral health is when the back teeth rub. So when we create our occlusal scheme, we wanna make sure that the back teeth don't rub. So the movement of the incisal edges of the lower incisors against the signalums of the upper incisors create and determine the anterior guidance. The only job of the anterior guidance is to make sure that the back teeth don't rub. When the back teeth rub, we get muscles that are working in non-harmony. We get teeth that break. We get teeth that are unstable. All that because rubbing of the teeth is caused by um, non-fully seated joints. So we need to get it correct and we cannot look, overlook the lower incisors when we are doing our occlusal scheme. So our goal is that when the jaws are in CR, so when the joint is seated fully, when the teeth bite, the teeth have to be in MI. We take a series of photos to, um, to determine our occlusal scheme and to determine our interior aesthetics. And basically we look at all of them, but we, when we look at um, the anterior teeth, shots um, seven to 10 is really what we concentrate on. Another thing that I'm going to, to mention as a side, as an aside is actually the neutral zone. So when we're talking in football, the neutral zone in football is the width of the ball and it cannot be pinched before the play starts. The same thing, so in dentistry, the neutral zone is the space that the teeth reside in because we have the outward force of the tongue and the inward push of the lips and the muscles and there is a balance and with that balance comes a space where the teeth will actually reside. So if you can just see from this animation here, we have the teeth erupting, then we have forces outward from the tongue, inward from the lips, and we have to keep the balance in order for the teeth to become stable. So does the neutral zone affect our anterior restorations? It absolutely does. 
So there is really no occlusal scheme that can stabilize the teeth if they are in an unbalanced relationship with a muscle, if there's muscular forces against them. Because when teeth and muscle war, muscle always wins. So a lot of instability that happens in the teeth happens because we pinch that neutral zone where the muscles where the muscle forces are. So if the centric relation has been verified, after we verify that our joint is seated fully, then the next thing we have to do is we have to look at the lower incisal edge position and contour. And those are the first decisions that we must make regarding the whole occlusal scheme. So the lower incisor uh, edge position is oftentimes overlooked, overlooked because when we restore anterior teeth, a lot of our patients say, I just want to fix the upper teeth because that's what shows. The lower teeth don't show, therefore, I don't want to concentrate on it. But unless we know exactly where the, the um, incisal ledges of the lower anterior are, we can't really create our upper anterior teeth. So the lower incisal edge position is critical to aesthetics, phonetics, the occlusal plane, the function of the anterior teeth, and it's definitely critical to stability, and we're going to go over each one of those. When we look at the incisal, uh, lower incisal edge position, it definitely has um, a flat facial thirds. It definitely has an, um, a wide incisal, and it has the, the incisal, the incisal angle is very, very um, prominent, and that's what we call the leading edge. And that is the driver in anterior guidance. So the incisal, so the lower incisals are critical to aesthetics in the Vig and Brundle study that we use when we do our, our, our aesthetic determinants. In a 30 year old, when we speak, we show a half of millimeter of uh, lower incisal edge. When we go down, when we um, get older to 70 years old, then we show up to three millimeters of uh, incisal edge on the lower teeth. So that's why they are very, very critical to aesthetics because they do show when we speak. That's the, it's the speaking, um, speaking position of the teeth. So, so that, so during, Speaking, the incisal half is visible, and the and the correct positioning of the lingual of the upper anteriors is actually dependent on the position of the lower incisor uh, plane. It's critical to phonetics because we have to approximate the lower incisal edges with the cingulums of the upper teeth when we make the S sound. So there is a special relationship between the lower incisal edge position and the opposing surfaces of the, um, of the cingulums of the upper teeth for us to make the proper S sound. It's critical to the lower incisal edge position and it's critical to the occlusal plane. We know that um, the curve of speed and the curve of Wilson, and they start from the, um, the curve of speed actually starts from the incisal edge of the lower anterior teeth. And what we want to see is we want to see the whole uh, lower incisor scheme be in a convex rather than a, than a concave position to be able to, um, to approximate against the cingulums of the upper teeth. So the lower incisors are very much critical to stability. So when we have the two fully seated joints that are actually bone braced, 
there is a definite stop there. And then when the lower incisors are occluding against the cingulums of the upper teeth, then you get a tripod, which is an inverted tripod, which is actually very, very stable. So the joint, the joint movement must happen from a fully seated position. And once you have this tripod, then basically you have to, you can literally throw the back teeth in there, get them, get them to occlude properly, and then in uh, maximum intercaspation, and then basically all you have to work is, you have to work out the guidance to make sure that the posterior teeth don't rub. So an inverted uh, tripod is, um, is, a very, very, is very stable, and that's why the incisors are very critical to stability. So having said all that, we're going to now start talking about the matrix of functional anatomy. So now that we understand the, um, the role that the joints play and the role that the lower incisors play in our occlusal scheme, we're going to talk about six decisions that we have to make about the contour the inclination, the position of the central incisors that determine the correct functional and aesthetic position in the mouth. So the first one we just spoke about actually, it is the uh, occlusion of the lower incisal edges against the upper cingulum. There is a definite stop that has to, that has to happen there. So when we customize the anterior guidance, what, what we're actually doing is we're designing a place that we can locate the correct um, position of the incisal edges. And then when we look at anterior guidance, we're looking at the idea of a bite and of a jet of the central incisors four millimeters of ideal over by two millimeters of ideal over jet. And then on the canines, we have five millimeters ideally of overbite and then one millimeter of over jet. So looking at, looking at the second uh, determinant in our functional matrix, it is the labial surface of the upper half of the central incisor. And, we want, and what we want to see there is the gingival head plane for proper lip rest has to follow the contour of the alveolar process. And that is actually captured, and that needs to be captured actually in the scan or in the impression. And the facial uh, preparation actually is a two plane preparation. And, um, the third determinant, okay, which is actually the labial surface, which is the incisal half, is again two plane. We determine that from our matrix, from our from our wax up. So once we get our, our wax up, we we have our um, our guides our prep guides, and we want to make sure that we use the prep guides to give the laboratory enough room so that we can make the correct amount of porcelain and we can have the correct contour of those teeth. So the facial plane must be in harmony with a lip closure path, and that's the reason why we need uh, two plane preparation. If the porcelain is too bulky, the patients will often complain that their lips bump on the teeth. Now, the only way that we can determine this is actually in the provisionals. We can determine this in the mouth. So when the lower lip closes, it has to come past the incisal edge and it has to close in a very, very smooth closure path. Number four, we talk about, now we are trying to figure out where the incisal edge, the actual incisal edge is, or the length of the incisal edge. 
So we evaluate the length of the sinusoidal edge using the smile line, the rest position, and the E position photos from the set that we take. So take a, take a look at these photos. You're gonna see that on the upper teeth, I don't know if you guys can see my, my monitor, but here I had to lengthen the incisal edges of these teeth because the wax up was very was very short. So what we're looking at, we're looking at the wet dry line from a from a 30 degree view from behind the patient. And we're trying to make sure that we keep those incisal edges inside of the wet dry line. Then we're also looking at the rest position and we're looking at the E position and that's how we evaluate where the incisal edge is. The most important thing though is that we evaluate the incisal edge using the F and the V sounds. Now, when we're looking at the E position, we're looking, we're taking a measurement of the borders of the upper and the lower lip. And then studies have shown that all the patients, we can bring the length of the incisors to the 50% mark and the younger patients up to the, up to the 70% mark. So looking at this here, you can see that when we take this distance, the 50% mark is right about here. And you can see how short this patient's teeth were. So that's the reason why we had to uh, lengthen those. But this is a very, very good determinant of how we figure out the, uh, the incisal edge. So when we look at the inclination of the incisal edge, the, the horizontal position actually precedes the determination um, of the length. It, it, it precedes the vertical position. So we have to figure out the horizontal first, and then we have to figure out the vertical. When we're looking at the, um, the F and the V sounds, if the patient closes, if they say the F and the V, and a lot of times what, they, what may happen is they may be hitting the incisal edge and the patient will actually say that it feels kind of heavy, then we can go ahead and reduce it. And we do all that in our provisionals. So now we have to figure out the um, anterior guidance. When we look at uh, the anterior guidance, we were looking at um, smooth. We're looking at a smooth protrusive path from uh, the contact all the way to the incisal edge. And we want the anterior guidance to be in harmony with the envelope of function. We're looking for smooth lateral excursions. And we're also looking for the anterior guidance to be correct both inside out and outside in. The other thing we're also looking at is we're looking at the uh, leading edge of the lower um, incisors, the lower anterior teeth. And again, remember we said that the leading edge is a definite incisal labial line angle. So to have this, it is the most the most natural looking, most stable. And again, it must form a definite stop on the cingulum to prevent super eruption of the tooth. When we're looking at long centric, and long centric is something that's, um, that's very misunderstood. 
we generally do all of our occlusal scheme with a patient sitting back. So when we're looking at lung centric, we have to seat the patient up in a very relaxed position and we have to have them bite. What happens when the patient sits up? Sometimes you get a little bit of anterior posturing of the, of the mandible and we end up hitting um, prematurely into that singular area. So what we want to do is we want to let the patient tap gently and we have two markers, a red and a blue or a red and a black. We have the patient bite when they're laying back on the black paper or the red and then we seat them up and we have them bite on the other color paper and we see if, the, if they coincide or if one of them is anterior to the other. The one that, that is anterior, we take that off until we create a very smooth path. Now, what we don't want to do is we don't want to adjust the lower um, leading edge of the lower tooth. That is the driver in anterior guidance. We always want to make sure that we touch or that we relieve the, um, the incise, the uh, link, the cingulum of the upper tooth. So again, we spoke about this before. We want lines in the back and we want, um, I'm sorry, we want dots in the back and lines in the front when we're talking about um, anterior guidance. So anterior guidance, basically looking at this animation again, we're looking at very smooth, um, a, a very smooth path and then the um, anterior guidance, we want, um, we have it so that we can prevent the back teeth from rubbing. Remember, the biggest enemy of uh, stable occlusion and comfort is back teeth the rub. We want the anterior guidance to be steeper than the posterior morphology, and that's how we disclude the, uh, the posterior teeth. And the job two of anterior guidance is to be in harmony with, with the envelope function. Then we evaluate. Um, so the anterior, the anterior guidance must be stiff enough to disclude the back teeth and concave enough to be in harmony with the envelope function. We just went over that. Then we have to evaluate the S sounds. Now, if the uh, if there's too much space in between the incisal edges of the lower teeth and um, and the cingulums, we're going to get the uh, the S sounds going to be exaggerated, or the patient is going to be lisping. So we want to make sure that we can add to the cingulum of the lower of the upper tooth if need to create a very, very smooth and a very, um, very gentle spoken uh, S. And that is actually always worked out in provisionals. So the last thing we're gonna talk about is, uh, we're gonna figure out number six, and that's the, uh, the cingulum contour. And that is the position right next to the gingiva. And we always evaluate that using the T and the D sounds. So my presenter um, screen has is shot basically. So I'm doing this all um, without my presenter notes. So please follow with me. So again, we've gone through the, our complete examination. We did our 2D, our 2D and 3D treatment plan. We've done our provisional prototypes in plastic, and now we're ready to go from our provisional prototypes to, death, to definitive restorations. Um, so how do you communicate that with your ceramics? Okay, so everything has to be worked out in the provisionals, like we said. The provisionals is a test drive for the final restorations. So we have to make sure that we tell our patients that they must be, um, they must do everything with the provisionals that they would do with their final restorations. They have to eat, they have to eat, they have to chew, they have to make sure that they don't baby them. If anything breaks, 
we want to make sure that the, that they break in the provisionals so that we can go ahead and figure out what the issue is and correct it before we go ahead and do our permanent restorations. So once the patient has approved the provisionals, then we take a Facebook record, we take photos, we take scans or impressions if you happen to be taking impressions of all provisionals. Facebook and photos are very, very, very key because that's what your laboratory technician is going to, um, to use to fabricate the final restorations. We want to make sure that we give them a prep shade. Um, if you're doing aesthetic work where you're doing either Fitzpatrick or whether you're doing um, anything other than zirconia, you're going to need to give them a prep shade. So then the ceramist will replicate the patient approved provisionals in the porcelain. Once the provisionals, uh, once the permanent teeth, the porcelain restorations are put in the patient's mouth, there's no surprises because they are an exact replica of what the provisionals were. We're gonna go over a case right now, um, a case that I did uh, a few years ago that uses all these principles that we spoke about. So we have our, um, our photos, the, the series that we take from the, um, from the uh, academy, uh, the academy series that I call them. Breast position, E position, tip down smile. That's the 30 degree smile that I call. And then we have side views. And all of these photos are actually meant to give us diagnostic aids. And when you come to the academy and do the courses, we're going to teach you exactly what each one of these photos mean. We're looking at the uh, at the gingival contour. We want to make sure that everything is in harmony. In this patient here, you see that uh, tooth number nine and ten uh, and eleven were um, the gingival was higher than than seven and eight. So we needed to do some something there. We're looking at the E position, and um, the teeth were definitely short. Golden proportion is um, is something that we use with every with every single patient, and we want to make sure that the teeth are in harmony with the golden proportion. That all the teeth, the 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 shape and the size of the teeth are in harmony with each other and with the patient. So in this case, we are we have a nine millimeter wide um, central incisor. And then we need to figure out what do we need to make, uh, what do we need to do to that tooth or to the set of teeth to make um, to make the teeth in harmony with a golden proportion and with the tooth itself. So we're looking for an 80% length to width ratio. So in this case, we had to we had to extend the the teeth incisively, but we also had to do some gingival recontouring to um, to extend the teeth um, gingivally. Again, these are um, models of our wax ups. The preparations. Now, when I do these cases, because I can get that tripod effect very easily, I generally do them in two visits. I prep. The whole, the whole case in one visit, I take all my scans, my, uh, my prep shades, my, my photos, and I make the provisionals. Um, I take actually my scans in, um, in, this, in this phase, and then I have the patient come back three or four days later. We work on the provisionals, and um, if they're happy, we take photos of the provisionals, we take scans of the provisions, just like I said, and then we send them to the laboratory to, um, to get us the final restorations. So all of this is done generally in two main visits and a, uh, an auxiliary visit in between for, um, for photos and for um, scans of the provisionals. These are our provisionals. 
we we make sure that the provisionals are a replica of what we want our finals to be. So, um, so when you take a look at when you take a look at his mouth right now, you see how how easily it is for him to to smile, and you see how these teeth. Um, he's very re he's very relaxed because the teeth fit co correctly in the mouth. Um, we take a look at the before in the after in the uh, the rest. You can see how um, the incisal edges of those teeth were not visible during the pre-op, but yet visible during the provisional phase. So when he's smiling in these photos here. You can see on the upper one, he has to strain his lips to smile, to show his teeth, and you can see how much more natural they are on the bottom. So we're going, well, we're going to go into our definitive restorations. Now, so this original work was done in 2017. You see here, he's missing the, uh, the first molars. So in 2022, uh, five years later, we ended up doing the um, the restorations on those um, on those implants. And here are the photos from 2022. So five years later, it's been it's been almost seven years now. This was done in January of 2017. So it's been seven years now, and his teeth look exactly the same that they did when we did them. He takes very, very good care of them. The occlusion was correct. Um, and aesthetically, um, patient was very happy. So this is um, this is the before and the after. The ceramics were done by uh, Shoji Suruka from Baby Dental Lab. And um, we're very proud of the work that we put out for our patients. And um, thank you to Shoji for helping us. So I'm going to leave you with a couple of things. I'm actually done with the presentation. I'm going to leave you with a couple of things. One of my um, one of the my very best quotes that I love is this one here: "No one can go back and start a new beginning, but anyone can start today and make a new ending." So think about that one. And then I'm going to leave you with this slide that you can actually. Um, scan to request more info from the um, from the academy it's um core one occlusion and small sign and um the next one is going to be in nashville may 17 and 18. it's a great time to be in nashville so i'm going to leave it up for a second you guys can go ahead and scan that and with that i'm going to thank you all and um I'm going to thank my teachers, my mentors, my students, my colleagues, and our team at the Center for Smiles for their support in helping me honor Dr. Pete Dawson's legacy. God bless you all. Thank you. Great job, Dr. Right. Wallace. <laughs> awesome job. Awesome job. So, how do we do with time? You're great. You got a little over 10 minutes. Everybody that's with us, this is your time to ask Dr. Rallis any questions about the course here that he just put on. So use the Q&A and uh, we'll give you a little bit of time to type in a, a question if you have it. So I see we have a lot of notes in the chat. Is that something that uh, are those questions? We haven't had any direct questions for you yet, but let's okay. see anyone has anything that uh, they want answered. And remember with the Q&A, you can answer anonymously too. So when somebody puts uh, something in the Q&A, it's gonna show up as a number, one, two, three, whatever. It should come up as a question in the Q&A. Okay. Got it. And we'll give folks just a little bit of time. Maybe you just did such a great job. Nobody has any questions. Well, well maybe see. nobody understood anything I said. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> so there's a one in the chat. Do you want me to read that out to you or can you sure. see it? Sure. 
So what is the sequence of full mouth rehab? Is it anterior first? Um, it's provisionals first. Now, whether it be anterior or posterior first, 